<clears throat> so good morning and welcome back. Today I'll be talking about the food service on the pre Amtrak railways. And food service is something that has been a staple of long distance train service in the United States. The service has come back into the public eye over the last few years due to Amtrak's leadership's current push and subjecting riders to what I'm calling the Anderson experience, which is raising fares and feeding people lean cuisine inspired meals in the dining car to the people you know who pay a lot for sleeping car first class fares and trying to tell people that it's first class when it's not even equivalent to anything on an airline and you know eventually just basically just telling coach passengers to shove it on top of all this this is in sharp contrast to the freshly made meals available on all Amtrak trains with a dining car a tradition that Amtrak has kept going since it took over long distance trains in 1971 this is a tradition that actually goes back all the way to the early 1900s. In this video, um, we'll be exploring what some of the railroads offered on trains in the Western United States. So this is gonna be a slightly different video for this channel. Like normally I would talk about one specific route and what they did. And I would, since it's a Western um, West Coast based channel, I would normally be talking about the Southern Pacific. But in this video, I pretty much won't be mentioning them that much. And also for the sake of limiting the scope of this video, I'm generally going to be limiting to this, this to um, food services after World War II. So outside of the daylights, um, the SP frankly wasn't that big on food service. Like, I mean, I'm not going to say that they were terrible, but they were average. It's like comparing basically the U.S. Big Three and British Airways to a foreign airline that actually had good food service like Singapore Airways or something. I don't really know. It shows how often I fly considering I only know like one airline that offers good food in the world. But basically it's like, comparing the domestic U.S. airlines and British Airways to these like flag-carrying airlines of other countries that actually give a damn about putting on a good face. And the SP basically was that of railroads. It had acceptable for the time food service for first-class passengers, but it wasn't, to put it bluntly, it wasn't amazing. It was pretty standard fare, so that's why I'm not really going to talk about them. Also to top it off, the main reason is, another main reason is that the menus they, that they had didn't really survive that well compared to the other railroads that I'll be talking about. And the SP also had a habit of ruining its food service as time went on. It was also one of the railways that decided vending machines would be a good idea to put in dining cars instead of having dining cars, which is a thing that Amtrak undid when it took over the Sunset Limited. And ironically, the Piedmont service in North Carolina has vending machines in its cars instead of food service. And the San Joaquin is going to have them as well for their five hour end to end run times. So good on them. So also to disclaimer, um, all the menus will are from Streamline Memories. I think it's .com. Hopefully my incompetent self will remember to link all the menus in the you know description, low bar, whatever. So hopefully they're all down there and you can figure out how to get the web address to just go to the regular website and all credit to whoever runs that website for saving all of these. So in this video, I will be exploring the food offerings of the Great Northern Railway, the Union Pacific, and the Santa Fe. Of the six or so transcontinental routes in the United States, the trains between Chicago and the West Coast, these were the top three when it came to, I guess, prestige and to some extent food quality. In the past videos on the Union Pacific and the Santa Fe, um, basically I mentioned that they were the top two railways that ran between Chicago and LA. And um, even towards the end, um, they were still like the first class services of the pre Amtrak days. And towards the end of this, I actually will bring up what the Amtrak dining menus are excluding their contemporary dining quote unquote because we're just gonna forget what that was because we'll talk about the pre-pandemic times and uh, basically just go to your local frozen food section if you're grocery store microwave a lean cuisine and that's basically what Amtrak's serving now and you actually probably have more choice than you do on Amtrak I mean from what I heard the food's not horrible as like it was at the beginning but yeah so to start all this off, I will, and also um, these Santa Fe menus, because we'll do the Santa Fe first, were generally from the 1950s. Actually, they all are from the 1950s. So, but I will start by summarizing their food service, since it is the one I know the most about and is has more of a backstory. <laughs> So to summarize the history of the Santa Fe's food service, the Santa Fe hired a man named Fred Harvey, who was an English immigrant who worked in restaurants in the U.S. from the age of 15 up until he started working with the Santa Fe. He had worked in a large array of restaurants from like the highest brow restaurants in New York to like corner bars. And when he started working for the Santa Fe, he set out to make the finest restaurants for its passengers and employees as he could. This set the standard for what a fine restaurant would be on the West Coast. And when signing cars became viable, the Fred Harvey company went from running trackside restaurants and hotels to running the dining cars as well. And this is how similar, in a similar manner to how Pullman ran the sleeping cars after their antitrust case, the railroad owned the equipment, but the company ran them. And there's like a whole other like history as to how this actually worked. And there's an interesting book on the matter. That is also a thing we will again leave 
for it into its own video, which I think had already been made. So when the company transitioned from working on trackside restaurants to working on board services, they still kept their high class, not bravado, but aura, I guess. This meant that they would cook like European food, European inspired food, because continental European crap was all considered um, high class and fancy back then. And they were generally trying to rival the finest restaurants like New York, Chicago, LA, what have you. And it also must be mentioned that a lot of the other railways actually did manage to do this as well. It wasn't just Fred Harvey, so he may have been the trendsetter on this, but he definitely was not the last or the only. One thing that Fred, the Fred Harvey Company was big on was that the food quality, and to some extent the menus on the various locations be the same. So a charbroiled steak in the LA Union Station would taste the same as one served on um, a train anywhere in the country or in a station in New Mexico or what have you. And the ingredients would all be sourced from the same place or at least to the same standard of quality and give customers a sense of consistency not really seen in America prior to the 1950s homogenization of American life. And as I mentioned, is notice that Fred Harvey's food was distinctly European compared to the other railways. Fred Harvey was British, but he, and he wanted to replicate European quality because it was something um, that was seen as fancy at the time and high class because, yeah, the European nobility, fancy. Basically, America had, like, very, at least America's upper class had, like, no concept of itself yet, but uh, we'll not, I'll not comment on that. So, of the three menus that I will hopefully have placed um, in rotation on the screen over the last few minutes while I've been talking, um, shows that the Santa Fe trains tended to have a few different um, options, usually around three, like, four or five meals, which generally included a charbroiled steak, a fish dish, a chicken dish, and usually, like, two other ones. And then on top of that, they would have a la carte options, so hopefully, hopefully I, I remember to do my job and actually rotate it. This is also kind of the response for me to stick all these in when I'm um, <laughs> editing this. One thing I do have to know is that a la carte options are available on all these menus, um, and also that there's a difference as to what was served on the trains and when, which one. Grand Canyon menu being the oldest, and the Texas Chief being newer. I think it is the newest of the three menus. Um, the Grand Canyon menu was printed seven years prior to the Texas Chief one. And then the similarities and differences that I wanted to point out in all of this is that they have a similar number of a la carte options. The difference being is that although the Chief was one of the more primary trains, whereas the Grand Canyon was a secondary train, the Chief tended to have like less, uh, the Texas Chief at least, tended to have fewer options on the menu, or at least a comparable number of options as the Grand Canyon did. And I will note that yes, the Texas Chief, is, although the Chief was not the Super Chief, which was um, still at this point hopefully had a full menu, and for full disclosure, the Super Chief menu was from the same year as the Texas Chief menu. The point that I'm making is that even though the Santa Fe um, wasn't big on cutting back on any of its services, um, especially on like the Chiefs, there had been some cutbacks on the dining services between 1950 and 1957. That being that there are fewer options because fewer options are cheaper to manage than having like a billion options on your menu. <laughs> Another thing that I would like to note on this menu is that they have the um, special California table wine, which is something I know that the Santa Fe and the SP tended to do, is that they served California wine on their trains. And this was way back in the day before the popularity of like Napa Valley and California wines was like a national um, thing because again America didn't really have like a concept of domestic fanciness at this point and we were basically just riffing Europe but even at this point railroads were selling California wines that were specifically bottled for them you could buy like a bottle on the train I don't know if it was like a full bottle like the 750 milliliters I think it was more like three four hundred probably about half the size but yeah we still um, had them. So the next major western railroad that offered a high standard of food service on their trains was the Union Pacific and hopefully Sam Dale and me um, just have the menus rotating because I don't really I'm not really gonna have like specific talks about some of them so hopefully I'm rotating these. <laughs> Union Pacific was at its time the biggest and richest railway and most influential in the U.S. history. The Union Pacific was one of the Pacific Railroads, and is the, frankly actually the only one to survive to this day under its own name. The Union Pacific may not have had the same effect on restaurants in the West like the Fred Harvey Company did and, you know, by extension the Santa Fe, but they still maintained high standards up until the end when they handed their services over to Amtrak in 1971. One story that I actually personally heard and read from the Colorado State Railroad Museum is about their fried chicken. The UP fried chicken recipe was one of the most popular dishes that they served on the restaurant. It was so popular they actually use it in their advertising and people could actually request the menu from their commissary or marketing department rather if you wanted it. And also an interesting note about their dining car service um, was that the winged streamliner design was basically on everything. Um, their plates, their menus, even seats and wherever they could possibly put it. And mind you, this was only on the city fleet chain, so that's Challenger and the other secondary trains didn't get this branding. And a on a fun note, at least fun to me, I found this amazing, is that it, they actually had very detailed stock of all their silverware on their passenger trains, noting that each dining car had over 1,100 pieces of silverware. 
and that the UP actually did keep a back stock of 200,000 pieces of silver in its commissary, which it replated on um, two-year rotating cycles. And to replate all their silver, the Union Pacific actually used 125 pounds of silver a year just to maintain their back supply. Uh, the Union Pacific was the only railway that I know of, in the Western US at least, that had dining service in dome cars. So looking at the dinner menus from the city of Portland and the city of Denver from the early 1950s, a few things can be seen. One thing is that the city streamliners tended to have five meal options as per usual, I guess. Had the fish option, chicken option, steak option, and then usually two others that varied by route. The fish option on the trains were different. The city of Portland had a Chinook salmon dish and the city of Denver had a mountain trout dish, which Shows that the UP tried to vary their menus to fit the route and likely what season they were given what um, was available as far as supplies went at that time because getting stuff out of season in the 50s was a lot harder than it is today. It's not like you can just like ship something up from the southern hemisphere. Another difference is that American society was a lot less modernized back then than it is now. I know someone's going to be like, oh yeah, like Tennessee and like, I don't know, Colorado are totally different. Yeah, there's differences, but the regional differences in the US then were far more pronounced than they are today. The difference was that there was a lot less travel for most of the population, so a lot of blending of local cultures didn't really happen, so there's a lot more regional variation. And on top of that, um, the 50s was just a weird time, like a weird... Basically, the delusion of going through the war and the Depression made everyone want to have, like, this, like, at least a middle-class society, want to have this, like, very boring and homogenous view of the world, which really affected at least my perception of someone who grew up in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, perception of basically anything before like the 1970s is like very much colored in this like image like the 1950s image of the world like as far as cultural differences though um until i talked to my got older and talked to my grandfather more i actually didn't realize that there was that much that i actually didn't realize how much of a cultural difference there was compared to like 1930s america compared to 1950s america because i basically thought all the way from like 1950 back to like basically the 20s was all the same as far as American cultural attitudes went, which was not true. But one of the main thread lines through this channel and through this explanation of history was that there's a thread line from the Depression through the Cold War, which is like the democratization of travel that eventually culminated, culminated, God, I can name it English, culminated in the push for deregulation in the 1970s. On the democratization of travel front, the Union Pacific did offer cheaper secondary trains, and by cheaper trains, I will make note that these are generally for now what we would consider the lower middle class. Travel at this point was mostly for the upper middle class and richer. Don't know why I went British on that. <laughs> Whatever. The breakfast options, as will be on the channel, will be showing the Challenger menu now, were similar to that of the coffee shop on the city's trains, and this included having you know bacon and egg plates that came with like toast, fruit, cereal, drinks the cold nine yards. The main difference between the dining car from what I can guess is would have been offered in the coffee shop on like the city trains and the Challenger diner or that, I, that there might have been slightly larger portions on the Challenger because you know main main diner not coffee shop. One striking difference I will note between the coffee shop menus and the Challenger di diner menus is that the dinner menu is very different. On the Challenger there was like full meal options including sirloin steak, lamb chocks, a roast beef meal, and a family um, ham meal option. The coffee shop dinner menu uh, for the city trains was basically just a short list of salad and sandwiches which kind of makes sense for the first class trains since your highest margin meal would be dinner it would make more sense that the railways would try to push people to eat in the dining car for dinner more so than other meals the main reason being at least in my mind as someone who's actually worked in restaurants is that people will drink alcohol during dinner more often than other meals of the day so people will be selling more wine and beer well, wine and hard liquor i don't really think they had much of a beer menu back then um, alcohol tends to have fire and other drinks tend to have far higher margins than like coffee or tea would and people tend to want to drink more of it so not to mention that dinner foods quote unquote tend to be of a different caliber than lunch which can mean having higher margins along with them the diner drinking wine with their meal also having dinner in the diner could lead to drinks in the tavern which again alcohol and drinks have a lot higher profit margins than um, just food does so trying to get people to go from like diner to tavern to spend more money is just something that you would want to push as a railroad so you can make more money and also i will kind of note that there's a thing that another reason that thing is that the railways did not at this point didn't really make a lot of money off of their ticket fares so they had to make other profits so pushing people into dining cars and taverns would make more sense unlike modern airlines where they basically just make all their money on the ticket and if they're one of those kind of airlines off of baggage fees, that's basically where all their money comes from. Railways had to make their money over your trip because 
you didn't pay for food and your and drinks and your ticket. And this is also a thing I kind of found that disgusted me when I was researching for this video was freaking cheese on apple pie. So this is one thing I've never encountered in my life until now and never knew was a thing, but it is slash was, is that people would melt cheese on freaking pie or in the filling or in the crust. And apparently this was a thing when apples were less sweet and sugar was less available and people wanted extra in their pie, so cheese in parts of the country with dairy farms. So freaking New England and freaking upper Midwest. So... <laughs> yeah, apple, apple, pie, apple cheese pie. So the final pre-Amtrak company that I'll be talking about is the Great Northern, and the Great Northern may not have had the same claim to fame on the food front as the Northern Pacific did with its two-pound baked potato. The one thing I want to talk about, um, at least as far as the Great Northern um, food service is concerned, is that its dining cars had menus that were similar to one another, or at least their dinner menus were. So basically the flagship Empire Builder and the secondary Western Star had very similar menus despite being one class, train being the first class flagship and then the other train being the secondary train running that corridor route or whatever you want to call it. On the other railways there was generally a big difference between the various train menus and a stark difference between the flagship trains and their primary and or secondary trains. The Great Northern like other railroads have offerings that reflect the regions that they're serving such as you know serving local fish and chicken and other region well i guess more regionalized food the only thing i've noticed about the great northern menus is they don't tend to have they don't seem to have a steak meal a broiled steak is on the menu but not a full meal like would be on other railroads even including the southern pacific compare all these menus so let's compare all these menus to the amtrak traditional dining menu and there are some differences one thing is that amtrak's menus or menu lacks a la carte options one thing i figure is that dining at least style culture wise has changed since the 1950s and now people now seem to expect an item be a full menu with its entree and sides so on the Amtrak traditional dining menu there are 18 meal options whereas the pre-Amtrak railway seem to have upwards of five per serving period along with a bunch of a la carte options and whether or not this is a good thing is kind of up to you your own interpretation i personally tend to prefer the way things are done now but this is also possibly because you know i grew up where this was a thing where that you would have you know your meal is like your steak with your potatoes with your other vegetable versus you can order the steak separately the potatoes separately the vegetables separately and the buns or bread separately versus just you order the steak and all that comes with all that just comes together like and at most you're choosing your sides and what kind of bread do you want but you're still getting all that included another major difference between amtrak and its predecessors is that the cafe slash coffee shop menus are different amtrak's cafe menu is filled with prepackaged foods like donuts chips candy bars crackers you know crackers and their toppings and a bunch of prepackaged food that they microwave or can serve cold like sandwiches Antrek still does like a, it still does serve sandwiches, but Antrek also serves pizza and hot dogs and burgers and all of it's from the microwave because, of course. One thing that Amtrak has benefited from is modern technology, three of which are the head and power, which is power generated by the engines, proper refrigeration, because before this they tended to use um, either wet ice or dry ice, which is either water ice or frozen carbon dioxide as refrigeration, and, um, and also that uh, the refrigeration one is also CFCs and the other one being microwaves. Amtrak's predecessors didn't have head end power, and electricity was actually generated by a, like a generator on the axle of the train, which only worked at certain speeds and above. And head end power is generator and the engine, or a secondary generator in the engine, and it runs power all the way down the train through wires. And the old way, the light was generally only used. Um, the ge electricity generally only used for lighting and maybe like water pressure at most, but that was usually steam powered as well. Refrigeration, as I mentioned, was done with ice, so basically it was a giant ice chest. And also. Um, Note on that is that a lot of the food in those days was still cooked on coal um, fires because gas couldn't be run through a tunnel or you couldn't have a gas tank because if a train crashed in a tunnel and exploded, it'd be, yeah, explosions and it's not fun. And also microwaves were not really commercially available till the 70s anyways. So if the old railways had the technology before they stopped caring about passenger trains, they probably would have had something far more similar to what Amtrak serves today. But by the time a lot of this technology was available, they didn't care about the trains, so they basically just use the outdated technology until they died, or at least handed them off to Amtrak. One service that Amtrak doesn't offer is drinking service, so despite offering alcohol even in cafe cars, one of the things Congress did when it created Amtrak was that it exempted them from state and local alcohol laws and sales taxes. Yeah, like you would literally pay sales taxes on everything you bought on a train based on what jurisdiction you were in. No idea how that works, by the way. And if it's, I can figure it out, and if it's interesting enough, I will make a video on it, but not right now. But that means also you can buy alcohol whenever the cafe car is open. On the Santa Fe alcohol menus, there's actually a list of state regulations on the back. And one difference between the two menus, that is the Santa Fe menu is a full bar menu, whereas Amtrak just offers some beverages. Part of the reason that Amtrak doesn't offer a tavern car 
at least in my opinion, like its predecessors did, is that Amtrak has to be both a form of transportation, a tourist engine, and a competitor against other forms of transportation while only running one train per day at best on most of its line, which means you have to have a lot of trade-offs being made and being decided on. And this means that some first-class amenities kind of got axed as time went on. And one thing that Amtrak's predecessors did was have multiple trains running daily along most of their major routes um, of the long distance and regional variety. And by that, I mean generally trains that have either an overnight portion or run more than 400 miles. For example, you know, there'd be like the mail train, with a, which would basically just be coach and maybe like a little snack bar, a secondary train, which was just the first class train with more stops with cheaper fares and probably not as much first class amenities. And then the, and there might be a couple of those. And then a full on first class train flagship city of San Francisco, Super Chief, Empire Builder. And depending on the route, there might be budget trains and the railway and how they decided to um, plan their products and whatnot. It, it really just depended on the route and the railway and how they marketed and did all their things themselves. I'm not saying Amtrak should like 100% go back to that, but it definitely should run more trains along most of its routes, at least twice per day, maybe even three or four, depending on the route. But again, Amtrak's not really giving the money to function. So again, write your, write your congressperson or whatever. I don't really know what to do besides like yes, stay outside, like sit outside of Congress in a big group yelling, build the damn train. I really don't know what to do on that front because they don't really care what we think. But if Amtrak ran more trains, it wouldn't have to split the difference as much um, with it's only one train per day. And Amtrak could run with higher standards along with improving, you know, standard sleepers. Basically, if Amtrak ran more trains, it could improve itself because it wouldn't have to split the difference as much. And even at one point, the Starlight ran with an extra lounge until it was axed by Anderson because, um, yeah, it cost too much money as far as he was concerned. I could go on and ask a whole video as to why he sucked, but that's a different, uh, it's a different subject. But adding one, uh, another lounge would enable them to have a bar and that would allow them to make more money, but I can make a whole video on that and probably will while I'm trashing, um, Anderson, because, yeah. Anyways, before I, I go into a rant, <laughs> I'm just going to end this here and hope you all enjoyed and have a good day and um, enjoy hopefully whatever this thing tries to make itself play at the end. And I will hopefully see you in the next one.